So let's get started now. I'm Kathy Olewski, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation Educational Webinar Series, and I love doing these webinars because I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. And today's uh, vasculitis webinar is a question and answer webinar about kidneys and vasculitis. We previously recorded a uh, kidneys and vasculitis webinar, and we had so many questions that we were we're so grateful to have two doctors with us today to answer the rest of the questions. So we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Brandt and Dr. Sunil Udani with us today. But before we actually get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping details. This is a live webinar. So we muted everyone except for the two doctors to reduce the background noise. If you happen to come in with your microphone on, please mute yourself. We're also recording this webinar so that others can view it soon on the Vasculitis Foundation website. And we'll, we'll begin checking the Q&A section today for questions from those of you who are watching us live. So to ask questions, look for the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, click the three dots to the far right of your screen that says more. And about those questions, we'd like you to remember that the doctors may not be able to give you specific advice about your situation because they're not your doctor. They'll do their best to answer questions thoroughly without advising you personally. And now mm -hmm. that all that housekeeping is done, let me begin by introducing our two speakers. Uh, first, I'll introduce Dr. Elizabeth Brandt. Dr. Brandt earned her medical degree at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. She completed a residency in internal medicine at Tulane Ho University Hospital and Clinic in New Orleans. And she completed a nephrology fellowship at the University of North Carolina Medical Center at Chapel Hill, where I met her, <laughs> followed by a vasculitis foundation fellowship. She practices nephrology at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And I might add, Dr. Brandt is also a patient living with vasculitis. She was diagnosed about 27 years ago. And I'd like to also introduce Dr. Sunil Udani. He is a consulting nephrologist with Nephrology Associates of Northern Illinois and practices in Chicago metropolitan area. He completed his internal medicine residency and nephrology fellowship at the University of Chicago Medical Center and received his medical degree from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm gonna ask questions, but I want you both to feel comfortable chiming in at any time. So if if uh, Dr. Brandt answers something and Dr. Udani would like to add on to that, please do before I start talking with the next question. We'd be happy to have both of you. Uh, let's see, we already have one question in the box. So I'm gonna start with that. Uh, the first person says, can avacapan help kidney function? I'm at 23% and off dialysis since October, 2022. I know avacapan is the new topic on everybody's ooh, ooh, ooh. tongue. <laughs> Dr. Brandt, you want to start? Sure. Um, I was actually, I just gave a talk this morning and was talking about avacapan. So this is very in my mind. Um, so yes, avacapan is good for kidney function. That is actually what it was studied for, was specific specifically for kidney function. So improvement in estimated GFR, improvement in proteinuria or albuminuria, um, and uh, does appear to be very effective. I've got a handful of patients on it. Um, I think most people are using it primarily for um, sort of more severe disease or disease that's a little bit difficult to get into remission. Um, and uh, But yes, great for kidneys, specifically for kidney function. Um, and I don't know that it's not good for extra renal manifestations, but that's just not what was studied in the advocate trial. It was specifically looking at uh, renal disease. And uh, Dr. Udani, you were at the ASN. You want to add anything to that? Well, I think the only thing I'd add is just the, the in particular, the value of Vacapan in, in terms of reducing or replacing the need for steroids. Because um, I think it's a complicated picture with kidney disease and vasculitis and steroid use, because we know the steroids, while initially have been helpful in vasculitis, from a kidney perspective, certainly cause quite a bit of other issues in terms of promoting fluid retention and weight gain and blood sugar elevations and blood pressure elevations that can all, in some ways, exacerbate the underlying kidney injury. So while they are helpful in certain ways, we also knew the other edge of it that they would you know, cause, you know, so oftentimes more trouble than we would like. Um, so the addition of, of vacapan in our sort of toolbox and as a way to replace steroids um, has been, I think, a 
a very significant um, uh, and, you know, a positive, uh, positive thing for us. And, and, and as Dr. Brown already alluded to, you really demonstrated that kidney function can be better with that as opposed to the conventional steroid treatment. Well, that's great. And it's great to hear. I know all of us are excited about something that will help us not have as many steroids in our life. Um, I, as a patient myself living with kidney involvement, I wondered if either of you want to comment on the need to reduce sodium in our diet. I, I just read a Washington Post article about something that was published in JAMA recently about it. Anybody, either of you want to comment on the get rid of sodium thing? <laughs> get rid of sodium thing. So, um, for patients who have kidney disease, um, our mantra, and Sunil, you tell me if, if your uh, perspective is different, but our mantra is generally think of sodium as being kind of poisonous in a sense. Um, I usually don't express it that way, but um, because kind of what Sunil was talking about with the steroids, you get fluid retention, you get high blood pressure. Um, and so uh, that is one of the many reasons that we sort of suggest people stay away from it. Now, if you have completely normal kidney function, and you're not sensitive to sodium, you don't blow up like a balloon or anything, it's probably okay. You don't have hypertension. But if you're a person with high blood pressure, whether or not you have kidney disease, if you have kidney disease, whether or not you have high blood pressure, I would tend to limit it. You don't have to, you're not going to get rid of it entirely, but try to limit it. Yeah, 100%. Um, the way I look at it is uh, in a similar way. So, you know, if you've had kidney involvement of vasculitis at some point or kidney disease from any other reason, we know that you know, there's some degree of reduced sort of kidney capacity. And you know, whether you're 30, 40, 50, 60, we want your kidneys to last you many, many more years. And salt loading and sugar loading, for that matter, essentially overworks the kidney um, by increasing the amount of blood volume as to process, increase the amount of pressure on the kidney, et cetera. And so salt restriction, and I would, I would also include with that, you know, sugar restriction um, are the two, you know, the things I um, advise uh, folks to say, say, you know, eat as much natural food as you can. Um, you know, things can only, if they can't spoil, they're either salted or frozen. So the more fresh foods you can eat, uh, the less salt content is going to be and the less sugar content is going to be in terms of, you know, fruits and vegetables. Um, and ultimately, we know that while it's obviously not as scientific as we would as a, a you know a drug study like Avacapan, there is certainly enough of a connection to say, okay, that is a good diet for the kidneys. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad you said that. Um, Kathy and I were actually talking about this the other day. Um, I think people, in, including physicians ourselves, often... Uh, I don't know if overlook is the right word, but you're trying to cover a lot of ground in a visit. Uh, but one question I get pretty consistently, is there anything I can do to help my kidneys? And my answer is always, yes, you could eat a healthy diet. And, and sometimes people don't honestly know what a healthy diet is, but I love the way you described it. And focusing on plants, um, plants, plants, and more plants, ideal um, from, from my perspective. So uh, yeah. That's, that's that's fantastic. Hundred percent agree. Yeah. That's great from both of you, and I'm going to do a shameless plug for the Vasculitis Foundation right now because we just did a webinar on uh, healthy anti-inflammatory lifestyle, both diet and lifestyle and everything, and it's on the Vasculitis Foundation website right now. So that would be pair well for education mm -hmm. with this uh, conversation we're having today. I, I saw this question from somebody, and it's one that I wanted to ask as well. What are the best choices for blood pressure medicines for patients with kidney involvement in ankylvasculitis? And it says, my husband has steroid-induced hypertension since his diagnosis. So, Neil, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, in, in the same mantra, um, again, the sort of the mantra I, I, I use is sort of, you want to reduce the workload of the kidney. If you've had any kind of injury to the kidney or increased stress on the kidney, you reduce the workload. So how do we reduce that? Well, the class of medications, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, Losartan, Valsartan, Lisinopril, Benazepril, et cetera, which have been around for you know, over three decades, um, are generally speaking, the best medications to preserve kidney function because they lower blood pressure as well as reducing the workload on the kidney itself. 
Now, there are some important caveats, and they're not right for everyone. They can increase blood potassium. There's certain people that simply just cannot tolerate them. But as a, as a, in general, if you can be on that as one of the medicines that uh, you can use for blood pressure control, um, we certainly, um, I would say, I would uh, advise that. Um, and then after that, you can kind of go along that pathway. Yeah. And I, I think the other um, class of medication that people are starting to get very familiar with, um, and even as providers having to get familiar with, are these drugs called SGLT2 inhibitors. That's your flozins, your empagliflozin, and that sort of thing. And uh, if you have diabetes, there's a pretty decent chance that you already know about these and are on them. Uh, but we also know that for patients with chronic kidney disease of any cause, it doesn't have to just be vasculitis, uh, that for the majority of, of those patients, these drugs are going to be helpful as well. Um, so something to, to talk to your nephrologist or your provider about, because um, those now with those ACE inhibitors and ARBs that Sunil was talking about, really very important and very um, impressive results in terms of benefit. Really impressive. Well, yeah, we all... and and go ahead. Sorry, just to, just to add, you know, we think about you know, I'm a, we're both nephrologists, and as we think about uh, preserving kidney function, we also know the other thing is the kidneys and the heart go you know hand in hand. And so, um, unfortunately, many of our patients die of heart disease rather than even before they end up on dialysis. Um, so we are, our thinking has sort of evolved in a way to say, okay, yes, we want to, of course, preserve kidney function, but are there any other things that can also add on to that that will, um, that will help reduce heart, uh, heart disease uh, is, is beneficial. And, and I think that this is always a little um, tricky because naturally, as you know, anybody, not you know, a patient with vasculitis or any, any, anyone else, Natural inclination to you know to minimize the amount of medication we need. It's perfectly a reasonable thing, but we also know that you know if there's been some injury to the kidneys or other organs, that we know that reducing the workload and extending the lifespan as long as we can um, has allowed us to live longer and live healthier. Um, so if there are tools, and again, uh, naturally each each person's um, their own. Um, but, you know, paired with the diet, paired with um, each of these uh, medicines, we have seen more and more tools that can really help people you know, live longer off dialysis, without heart disease, all the things that we want to see. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the goal. So thanks for sharing that with us. The next question is, I have GPA, which is affecting my kidneys. I have occasionally spots on my wrists that I'm told is vasculitis, but it's not critical as my kidneys. Is there any anecdotal evidence that avacopan can help with that or any other medications that don't impact my kidneys that might help with skin issues? Um, I can tell you that uh, there, for avacopan, there aren't data for that. Um, I think, you know, and I'm not a dermatologist, but um, it may be something as simple as topical steroids without, you know, seeing exactly what it is, but sometimes topical steroids would be adequate if, if that's the only thing that's active and it's not a massive area. Um, that's assuming it is confirmed to be vasculitis. Um, but if you've got other organ involvement, I think just your typical systemic uh, immunosuppression that you would be using otherwise is likely to be helpful. Yeah, and I think that it can be tricky because naturally your um, uh, someone's alarm bells are, are at a high level once you've had vasculitis because it comes out of nowhere. And so, um, it's absolutely critical to recognize these symptoms, findings, and, and, and point them out to your physician because we also know that kidney involvement in vasculitis can be, sometimes it's very overt and very obvious uh, when oftentimes when people come to the hospital when we first meet them, but they can be also more subtle. And, and I think just um, making sure that there's been a appropriate amount of you know, investigation, you know, urine tests and, and blood tests paired together and occasionally, you know, even repeating the kidney biopsies can be helpful to, to, to just to be certain that there is not a low level of ongoing inflammation, um, especially in, um, in these systemic vasculitis. And as per always, your advice is tell your doctor about that so that they can make yeah. that decision for you. Yeah, absolutely. 
The next question is, I live in the New Orleans area and I'm currently on a Macapan and only seeing my kidney specialist and primary care doctor. Should I be looking for a doctor that specializes in vasculitis? Well, it may be that your kidney doctor does specialize in vasculitis, in which case you may not need another doctor. Um, I have some patients that I see on my own. I have uh, plenty of other patients that we have a very multidisciplinary approach with uh, rheumatology, pulmonology, dermatology. Um, so it kind of depends on your disease. But if your nephrologist feels comfortable managing your entire systemic disease, then I think that's probably fine. Yeah, yeah, that's insane, I mean, yeah absolutely. And I think that, you know, depending on where you live, access to other specialists can be hard to come by. I mean, I know mm -hmm. where I work, a little bit harder to have access to rheumatologists. And so I end up managing a lot of the folks, um, you know, on my own. And again, as long as they feel comfortable and, you know, whoever puts you on the Vacapan is monitoring the response to Vacapan, then I think um, uh, that should be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, and speaking of Avacapan, as we have been doing nonstop since we started, um, have they expanded the use of Avacapan for eGPA and others? Uh, no, not yet. So currently, GPA and MPA, um, the trials, as all ANCA trials are done, well, vasculitis trials are always done in patients who have positive serologies, meaning they have a, a blood test that's positive for MPO or PR3, even though we know some patients don't have that, they just, their blood tests are negative. Um, but thus far, uh, just those two. However, um, they are definitely looking at a vacapan in a number of other diseases, not just vasculitis. And I'm really excited because I'm actually meeting with somebody on from Amgen, that's the maker of a vacapan on Thursday. And I'm, I'm writing down all of these questions <laughs> so that I, uh, that I'll be prepared. But thus far of the published data, it's uh, GPA and MPA. Dr. Budani, anything else? And the only thing I would add is that, you know, just to give you some context and some people may be familiar with this, a vacapan, um, it blocks something called the complement, part of the complement cascade. The complement cascade is a very primitive part of the immune system. It's not as smart as antibodies and, blood, and white blood cells. Um, but we realize it's extremely important in especially autoimmune conditions. Um, so vasculitis, lupus, and a lot of the autoimmune conditions that nephrologists see that affect the kidney alone. And so what we're seeing is that this targeting this pathway, that, uh, similar to the complement pathway, is becoming more and more, and you guys are both at ASN or anybody who's like, you know, ASN, there's a lot of talk about complement and new complement drugs. And so uh, Avacapan, uh, I expect, will be studied in other vasculitides, including eGPA and IgA vasculitis, um, uh, as well as other complement mm -hmm. inhibitors. And I think that um, the idea being, and the hope being, at least from a clinician standpoint, is that this is a way of targeting the immune system, quieting autoimmune disease without knocking out the rest of immunity, which has been, unfortunately, the way we approach things you know, for the last few decades, uh, because that's what we had. So things like cyclophosphamide and even prednisone, which are much less specific. So I think that certainly the hope is that we can say, okay, this is this pathway is much more responsible in this disease. So let's target that um, and leave the rest of immunity intact. Um, so while Avacapan has shown remarkable results, I think just for people to get context, it is, you will almost definitely see a flood of other medicines that work on the complement pathway, not necessarily the same as a vacapan. Um, and so, uh, and, um, uh, you know, that may be the option that even if a vacapan is not studied in that disease state. And, and important to note that a vacapan is not intended to replace rituximab, cyclophosphamide. It's an adjunct to those. Um, and hopefully uh, can at least, if not eliminate, reduce the steroid exposure, as Sunil mentioned earlier. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I, there's a lot of questions coming in right now, so I'm trying to get to all of them. But one interesting thing is, do you know if COVID has a direct impact on kidneys? 
Well, <laughs> well, exactly. judging, judging from all those people on continuous dialysis in the hospital with COVID, yes. Um, yeah, so, and I guess it depends on um, sort of exactly what that question means. We definitely, um, and Sunil, I'm sure you saw far more patients than I did because you're in Chicago. And um, we did not have that. We saw very sick people, but it wasn't like this flood of patients where, you know, you just can't even keep up with them. Um, what we saw a lot of times were people who required a, a form of continuous dialysis. Now, whether it was because of a direct action of COVID on their kidneys or just the fact that they were so sick, they were what we call septic, um, they had very low blood pressures, they required medication just to maintain blood pressure. Um, so, uh, so probably a combination of things. As it relates to vasculitis specifically, I will tell you that I, I and I, there's been conflicting reports on this. I do think that there's some patients where their vasculitis is either um, instigated, for lack of a better word, or a flare is in response to COVID or even vaccines and not just the COVID vaccine, because I, I definitely have patients who meet both of those. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think we saw the whole spectrum as, as um, Dr. Brown, you, you alluded to. I mean, I think that, you know, we're still unraveling this whole uh, mystery of COVID and you know, how it affects the body. Um, uh, there were certain people that, you know, had kidney injury much more severe than the rest of their illness, um, suggesting it may have a kidney specific effect. And there are other people that um, were just sick overall and developed kidney injury or had some mild kidney disease and their kidney function deteriorated quite rapidly. Um, I will say, thankfully, um, for whether it's because of repeated, you know, vaccine exposure, repeated um, uh, natural, natural infection, our COVID related kidney manifestations or kidney illnesses have not been nearly like they were two years mm -hmm. ago. Um, and we have patients in the hospital with COVID and, you know, uh, not, you know, as Dr. Brown alluded to, when during the, the, those, those first waves and that second major wave in, in um, early 2021, we had our entire ICU and every dialysis machine was, was mm -hmm. occupied. And it was, you know, it was our nightmare. Um, thankfully, we are way, uh, we have come far from that and we, hope to never go back to that. Um, so exactly how it affected it, uh, I'd say, yes, I would say that, um, you know, we were still not sure, but I would say that for whatever reason, um, the kidney specific now the symptoms do not seem to be as severe anymore, which you, uh, people should feel some degree of, you know, comfort in. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I, I'm getting a series of questions on one topic. So I'm going to shift us over a little bit there. Um, several people, because of what you said, are asking blood pressure keeps getting mentioned. What's a good blood pressure range for people with kidney involvement with ankylvasculitis? One said female age 54, and another one said someone in the late 60s with compromised kidney function. I thought that was a good question. It is a good question. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, we our goals for kidney, uh, our goals for blood pressure really are consistent across whether you have vasculitis or not. Um, and the, the, the goal of controlling blood pressure is primarily to reduce cardiovascular events, so heart, heart attacks, strokes, things like that. And what we know is that if you can get your blood pressure to the you know, one teens over 60s, that's ideal. Now, there's some very specific things, though. So there was a large study that was done that, was, that sort of outlined this. Um, but in that study, they also measured blood pressure in a very specific way where you had to be, you know, not the, you go into your office, your doctor's office, they check your blood pressure and you write it down. Like that's not, it was, you were sitting for at least five minutes, resting in you a know, quiet room, get a blood pressure at home, measure one reading, discard the first reading and measure two more readings after that and about two minutes apart. And with that technique, then getting your blood pressure down to the, those levels. Now that's again, that's individualized. There's certain people I can't tolerate lower pressures, but I think that a lot of talk is there's a lot of discussion about blood pressure control, but we don't talk enough about how they actually measured it to show that the, that was the way that was the, the level of control you you, did, you would you would want to target. 
Dr. Brandt, yeah. you want to add something? I don't, I don't have a ton to add, but um, we do uh, a fair amount of 24-hour blood pressure monitoring through our clinic. And it's sort of interesting you talking about discarding that that first reading. When we get the 24-hour monitor back, I always have to discard at usually the first two or three. And I think it's the startle reflex when the, the first couple of times that puff inflates because um, it just does it automatically every 20 minutes. And um, that those readings can be like horrible and then get past those first two or three and then the blood pressure might be perfectly beautiful. So uh, so I think that's a really great point to make. And always that sitting, both feet on the floor, arm sort of, sort of at heart height, not right after you've eaten, not right after you've taken a warm shower, that's cheating. <laughs> so uh, yeah. It's good to hear you both say that because sometimes a doctor takes our blood pressure and we think it's higher than what we monitor at home. And it sounds like you're empowering us to say, could we take it a couple of more times and just see and, and let me sit calm for a few minutes. So I, I appreciate you saying that. And it'll uh, often be higher in the clinic. It will often. So we try to encourage patients to monitor their blood pressure at home, bring those readings in or even bring their monitoring because they typically have a memory on them um, to sort of review them. So, uh, so yeah, that, I don't get too excited about it. But, you know, if it's 200 over 103, I'm like, wait, maybe we should look at this a little bit more closely. But but even then, I have patients who can have some pretty outrageously elevated clinic pressures and perfectly lovely at home. So great. OK, and uh, next question. How beneficial can Mepolizuab? <laughs> I don't know if I said that. Oh, Mepolizuab, right. I think is what they're talking about. How, how beneficial can it be to assist uh, chronic kidney disease as a result of eGPA vasculitis? I don't know that I have an answer for that. Do you, Sunil? I don't. I don't have, a, I don't think we have a good um, amount of data on that specific, um, uh, that specific, you know, question or agent in terms of renal, renal outcomes, unfortunately. Okay. So the answer is ask your own doctor. <laughs> and I'm making and, a note of it so come. I can yeah. uh, inform myself. Right. Yeah. Um, next question. We had a couple of questions about diet after you all talked about anti-inflammatory diet. One was how much protein should patients with chronic kidney disease have? And one was about you, you go for that one and I'll find the other two. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so in terms of the protein question, um, so, hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a little it's bit of a complicated sticky. story. I'm yeah. like, where to begin? <laughs> yeah. So there's some really old data, and they're they're almost certainly true about very very strictly limiting protein in the diet um, was favorable for kidney function. However, it was not favorable for overall nutritional status and overall health. Um, so not super logical. Um, what I will tell you from my perspective. Uh, this and this is not just like oh it's nifty I made it up off the top of my head um, it is based on some a fair amount of research and uh, literature and stuff is again going back to plants rather than animals animal proteins are just very hard on our systems they do tend to be pro-inflammatory uh, they're harder for us to process um, they come along with a lot of other things like uric acid and phosphorus that's very hard for us to uh, to manage, whereas you can get those same things, proteins, phosphorus, whatever, from plants and not have that deleterious effect. So to the extent that you can get rid of animal proteins, and I mean by that, I'm sorry to tell you this, I mean all animal proteins. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to rip the cheese out of your hands, <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, and, and you don't have to be perfect, right? But to the extent that you can um, limit, limit the animal products. And I, I love the way that you described it of, if it won't spoil, it's not, it's not good. <laughs> that is, that's brilliant. Um, and so, uh, and you know, like I, I live by myself, so I just can't eat stuff fast enough before it does go bad. So fresh frozen, perfectly acceptable. Um, really, it's just flash frozen. It's fine. Um, but yeah, if you can stick more with plants and more vegetables, even than fruits, there you go. Sounds hundred percent. Hundred percent agree with Dr. Brent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for outlining it so well. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of complexity about protein intake. But those studies, as you alluded to, you know, they didn't 
separate out plant versus animal protein. So I think, you know, my general rule of thumb is, you know, uh, somewhere between three quarters and one gram per kilogram body weight. So if you weigh, you know, 60 kilos, then, uh, somewhere between 15, 60 grams of, of, of protein, but not as much focusing on the amount as it is on the, the source. And so lentils and peas and things that, again, are, are plant-based uh, much more. I'm just saying, you know, eggs is the one exception, I would say. You know, you could probably get away with more eggs just because they are less than certain, certain uh, metabolic load. But um, but uh, in general, uh, you know, if you can eat that plant-based foods, then you won't need to necessarily worry about protein loading, and particularly protein loading that is created to increase burden on the kidneys. Yeah. And that is, I'm, I'm so glad you used that exact phrase because, and I've, I've seen this patients who come in and they're eating just a massive amount of protein um, because they think it's good for them. Their personal trainer told them it was good for them. And I'm like, is your personal trainer a nephrologist? No, they're not. And <laughs> I disagree with that. Um, and the reality is, is if you eat excessive protein, your body can't do anything with it anyway. So there, there's just no benefit to that and potentially a fair amount of harm. So, well, that is great for us to know because we do get answers from other places in our lives. So I appreciate you um, bringing that up. And again, plug for the integrative health webinar that's this Saturday that will answer some of those questions to yeah. wonderful doctors talking to us. Yeah. Uh, also, I want to tell you that um, another question that came up about diet is when you talk about reducing sugar content, does that include the intake of maple syrup or honey? And the other one was when you're recommending lots of vegetables and plants, what about their effects on potassium levels? Ooh, ooh, it's such good questions. <laughs> Um, so if you want to be very, very, um, very particular about the, the animal base versus plant base, you would not eat honey, but you can eat maple syrup. I love honey. So that, that is, I'm sorry. I'm, I just, I, that's, I could give up cheese, but I can't give up my honey. Um, so, uh, but in general, you want to limit sugars of any kind, but to the extent that you need a little sweetener, better to use like a maple syrup or an agave or whatever, rather than like a white sugar, just granulated white sugar. Um, and there was another part to that. Oh, potassium, potassium. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in general, I would say there's probably somewhat less risk. And this is just anecdotal observational on my part, somewhat less risk of significant hyperkalemia if you stick with the plants, and again, some fruits are very problematic um, and uh, and less so the animal proteins, but also remember that you can eat any of these plants, fruits, vegetables, whatever. It's more about the total content. So we recommend um, less than about 2000 milligrams per day, kind of like sodium, although less than 1500 is better. Um, and so if you, uh, can look at the potassium content as long as you sort of stay with that, within that. So if you're going to have your ginormous baked potato that has 900 milligrams of potassium, guess what? You can't also have three glasses of orange juice. Like that's that's a no-go. So a lot of it's looking at the, at the cumulative. I personally don't tell anyone I said this. I personally don't <laughs> get too jazzed if somebody's potassium, like our upper limit of normal in our lab is five. But if somebody's got a potassium of 5.2, and they're eating a really healthy diet. I don't, I don't get too excited about that. I'm like, that's enough. You know, don't go above that. But to me, that's not really a problem. Shh. Absolutely. <laughs> nephrologists, nephrologists think alike, which is a lot of. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that the growing emphasis that we're seeing is that, again, natural sources of, of these things are generally healthy and the likelihood of getting to the dangerous range is less. Um, so, and to what, to what Dr. Brand said in terms of, you know, total quantity. So yes, you shouldn't have a salad of avocado, guac, you know, avocado, mangoes, melons all together, but any of those foods in, in separation. Um, so I think that if you're, if you're making dietary choices, much more likely to stay in a healthy place, if you're going plant heavy, then 
you know, as much with issues of potassium. And you may end up lowering your blood pressure um, as well. You may end up needing less blood pressure, lower medication. Um, Diabetes you know, medication. Blood sugar medication, all that. So, um, uh, so yes, I think that... Uh, as, not that we're always perfect, but, but certainly I'm not always perfect about it, but uh, the more sort of plant heavy you can be, the better. So there are many more, believe it or not, questions about uh, diet related things. So you two have brought up a lot of questions and people, but we're kind of in the home stretch here. So I'm going to move to a couple of other questions that people are asking and just make sure we we touch on as many subjects as we can. The next we'll definitely one, go to that other webinar for, for yeah. the nutrition stuff too, as, a, and I as will, a sort of a longer format. And I will talk about it at the end of this so that people know what to do. Um, if you, one person said my blood pressure, you sort of answered this already, but I just want them to have your answer. If my blood pressure is in the, in the high, if my BP is high 120s, low 130s, is that too high? Well, it's kind of context, right? So yeah. in some people that would not be a big deal, but as we talked about earlier, a little, and, and it's going to depend on things like age and how the blood pressure was taken and all that. But in general, um, if you can get that a little bit lower, that you don't want to be like falling over because you're lightheaded, but if you can gradually get that lower to less than about 120, um, that would probably be preferable. Yeah, I mean, they, we know that like it's all incremental, right? It's not it's not binary. It's not you know, one thirty is bad and one eighteen is perfect. It's as Dr. Brian alluded to, you know, the lower you can get it, and you know, does that mean taking a fifth medication? Probably not. Probably not. There's probably a you know, while we talk about blood pressure goals, we also should think about how you get there. So if there's a way to you know, diet, make dietary changes in both salt and sugar, for that matter, or ways to um, increase act physical activity, which we know can also help. Um, that would certainly be a preferential way to get you down further, um, as opposed to necessarily adding the the fifth medication just to get from one twenty nine to one sixteen. And can I throw out one more thing that is not about? protein or blood pressure or blood sugar specifically? Because the other question that I get or I feel like often has to be addressed in our population in general is weight. And people are like, oh, I need to lose weight. I would like to get away from the weight loss focus. If you will, and Dr. Rudani, what you were talking about just now is, you know, if you'll eat this way, you might not need these medications and things. The same is true for weight. First of all, we're not all intended to be stick figures. I'm thin. I was born thin. I'm always going to be thin. I tried to get bigger. It didn't work out for me. Um, I did not really. Um, but if you will eat in a sane, healthy way, the weight will tend to take care of itself. That's not going to be true hundred percent of the time. I have patients who weigh 400 pounds. Guess what? That horse is out of the barn. You're probably going to have to take some extra steps. But in general, um, if somebody who needs uh, moderate uh, to slightly significant weight loss, don't focus on the weight loss. Focus on the eating healthy. The weight will take care of itself, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's that's exactly it. I think that we focus a lot on that number, which is understandable. Um, it's everywhere. It's talked about all the time. But I think that... Um, uh, and, you know, understanding that I tell people like, do the best you can stick to your, your diet and, and your regimen, get on the straight and narrow for six days of seven and the seventh day. Cause you know, we still, the whole point of this is we still want to live a, you know, an enjoyable life, right? And that's what we're trying to do. And food is, food is part of life and it's part of company and sharing time with people, especially this time of year. So, um, you yeah, know, we understand that, uh, uh, you know, the intention is not to be perfect. It's to most times make is uh, the optimal choices for you um, in terms of particularly like again foods that are foods that look like food and act like food <laughs> yeah and you kind of have to know yourself too like there are people who think nothing you know like they don't they couldn't care less if they ever had a cookie again in their life i on the other hand look at a half gallon of ice cream 
has a single serving. I mean, like I just, <laughs> that is my, I can't, I just can't. So I know myself that there's not a little sweets. It's a lot of sweets. And so I try to do no sweets. I fail miserably about 60% of the time, but you have to know yourself. For some people, it's not the sweets. Please don't say, oh, I have to get rid of carbs. No, you don't. Carbs are not evil. Candy version of carbs, not so good, but some lovely brown rice, delish and super healthy. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't look at, you know, I must get rid of entire food groups Maybe. like that, but, but know yourself. And if your thing is like, oh, I like to drink a six pack of beer every night. Now, you know, that is not good for you. Come on now. Come on now. And so, uh, yeah, if okay. you can't do it in moderation, don't do it. And if you can do it in moderation, then do it in moderation. Well, we've got our marching orders, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that was some great advice. I have one final question. And this one is for you, Dr. Brandt. Uh-oh. And 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 I've been quite full of my disclosure that I know both I know you and and saw you in practice when I was early in my diagnosis. But I just recently learned that you are also a patient living with vasculitis. And I want to ask you: Is it the chicken or the egg? Were you interested in vasculitis before you were diagnosed, or is it the opposite? Never heard of it. Had never heard of it. No, I was a musician like that. That was my thing. And uh, at a most inopportune time, I was diagnosed. Um, I had sinus, pulmonary, renal involvement, all the things. Um, I was pretty sick. I didn't realize quite how sick I was because, you know, um, and I try to teach this too to our trainees. I was talking about this this morning. If something has been a problem for long enough, it becomes normal, right? It just, this is, this is just how it is. And so, uh, um, so yeah, so I had all the things and that kind of interrupted my other career aspirations, which, you know, that's fine. Um, but I had a wonderful nephrologist, actually, who diagnosed me and treated me. Um, and I and I think this is partly my own coping mechanism was to learn things. I was like, well, let me read about this. And I was like, what in the world? Um, <laughs> and so he was great. He'd be like, I thought we should try this medication. I will have the articles waiting for you at the desk. Like he just got where he knew. And so um, I found that it was really, really interesting. Um, so it kind of sparked something, not a, oh my God, poor me, I must go save the world. But like, it, it's really, really interesting. And, um, and I do feel like I have some understanding, you know, it can be such a long road. I mean, really, it's like, people feel bad sometimes for a really long time. Um, and just when they think they've gotten over it, oh, here it comes again. So, um, so I do feel like I have an appreciation for that and can say, you know what, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You might go through another tunnel, but there's still a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so yes, yeah, so definitely diagnosis first, interest, and then the whole medical school thing was like, have I lost my mind? Well, yes, is the <laughs> answer to that question. Um, and then I put that aside. And then a few years later, um, my own nephrologist said, you used to mention this and you don't mention it anymore. I think you should think about it. And so there you go. Here I am. Well, Student loans and all. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> well, amazing story. That's I, awesome. I think everybody on here probably just loves that story you just told. And that's why I asked you that question, but I'm afraid everybody, we were out of our time today. Um, and thank you so much to Dr. Brandt and Dr. Udani. You were so great at answering our questions today. And you brought them, your answers brought them to a real level that made sense to all of us, at least me as a patient. So I hope I'm speaking for everybody watching today. But there were a lot of thank yous in the chat box. So thank you so much. And if people have questions that, that we didn't get to or they're having trouble finding answers for, again, it can't be your specific, you know, treatment or whatever, reach out to the foundation because they will send along messages to us um, at times saying, hey, Absolutely. is this something that you can address? And I'm certainly happy to do that.